if this is, you haven't been here in a while or this is the first time here, you're going to be briefed here of where we have been in this season in this election series. Uh, Doug, if you put up being fearless this election year, I'm going to take some time I normally use for the sermon message, which will, message will be a little shorter, so we can kind of walk through where we've been. First in July, August, letting go detachments, and we'll see more of that in a minute. September, letting God willingness. Detachment willingness, so important for us as people of faith in stressful seasons like this one. And finally, God's gift of generosity. We could not let go and let God unless we knew we could bank on God's gift of generosity in the, in the past three Sundays and this one as well. So let's look a little bit at where we have been. First, letting go detachments. The next slide. I'll just read the green here. Detaching from division. Detaching from fear. These are stories from Mark chapter 6 and 7. Scriptures that are heard all over the world by many, many millions of Christians on those given Sundays. And this is the direction we took here. How to detach the first movement of faith so often in our world so we don't, do not have to be so controlling over what we cannot control. Take a moment. And then later on in July, more detachments. Detaching with compassion, detaching from self. Through all these detachments, we brought it home with this one slide from Thomas Merton. He wrote, a young activist, do not depend on the hope of results. How do we detach from the elusive hope of getting the political victory? Solutions we want to make room for our Christian hope of God's providence and resurrection. Knowing we may want some certain results, of course, but how to make room for the greater hope. And from detachment, we went from letting go to letting God, our willingness in September as we resume the series. Willingness to be humbled. A Gentile woman humbling Jesus. Powerful story, not often heard in churches. Willingness to suffer, taking up our cross, not Jesus's, but our cross and following. Willingness to be vulnerable. And from letting go detachment, letting God willingness, finally we pull into the paddock with the ones from the last three Sundays. God's gift of generosity, as you see being displayed in the three graphics from the Salvadoran artist Cerezo Barredo at the top. Let's see what, uh, go ahead and roll up the end of the slide there. Through Jesus teaching us, like he teaches the young man at the top, our possessions need not possess us. God is so generous, you need not to possess us. There is enough for all. For James and John, he has his hands around there in the middle saying, you don't have to practice your one-upsmanship anymore. There is enough for all. And finally, healing a blind Bartimaeus, top right, our desire to see, his desire to see, is fulfilled by his and our insight to the world's needs. So once again, Letting go, detachment, letting God, willingness, and all of it made possible by God's gift of generosity, which we continue with today as we conclude this series with the scripture before us. The great commandments, God's generosity made known. Let's hear the good news. One of the scribes came near. This, by the way, is Jesus is now in his final week, and the pressure's on. And the scribes, and the, who are the Pharisees, Jesus was most likely a Pharisee. This is his tribe. 
the Sadducees, the temple Jews, Jesus the Jew who's a Pharisee, they're all crowding around him trying to trick him. And the scribe comes to him and heard them disputing with one another and seeing that he answered them well, he asked him, which commandment is the first of all? Jesus answered, the first is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Then the scribe said to him, You are right, teacher. You have truly said that he is one, and besides him there is no other. And to love with him with all the heart, with all the understanding, with all the strength, and to love one neighbor's, one's neighbor as oneself, this is much more important than all the whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. By the way, that's what the Sadducees did, the temple cult, all burnt offerings and sacrifices. So the Pharisee is saying, yeah, we don't need those things. <laughs> so Jesus saw that he answered wisely. He said to the scribe, a Pharisee brother, you are not far from the kingdom of God. And after that, no one dared to ask him any question. Hear what the Spirit is saying to us as a church. Would you pray with me? O oh Lord, letting go, letting you, knowing your generosity is there. That this love can be there, even in this most, especially in this most stressful of seasons. Settle our hearts, O oh God, the seat of our emotions. Calm our heads, the throne of our understanding. And as you do, make plain before us your generous gospel. Amen. Which commandment is the first of all? Asked to Jesus by a scribe, one of a, tri one of a tribe lying in wait for their time to pounce on him to send him to his resurrection, or his crucifixion. His crucifixion. Jesus responds correctly, love God is first. And love God with all you have. And the words he uses here to express that first commandment, words known as the Shema, nothing radical. For the Shema is a cornerstone of the Jewish tradition to this day. In fact, we learned it at seminary. It's the only Hebrew sentence I remember. Shema Israel Adonai Leheinu Adonai Echad. Hear, O God, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. Certainly the scribe had no issue with that response or the love of God that he then expressed. But lest the scribe then define the God they love, that's the trap. Lest he then define the God that they loved, as was his religious leadership want. Lest the scribe define the God so that some were included and most were not. Jesus continues. Jesus gets out of the trap, adding what is not asked. What he says in Matthew's gospel is like the first commandment. He calls it here a second commandment. Love your neighbor as yourself. And then the clincher. There is no commandment greater than these. The first commandment you ask, dear scribal brother, I'm on board with our Shema. But how about a plural response to your question? How about the neighbor, 
picking up on our theme from the past three Sundays, the gift of God's generosity to us, and picking up on the theme from just last Sunday that our generosity is to be an emulation, a direct reflection of God's. Perhaps Jesus today, with his plural response to the scribe, is driving home that generous notion that the first commandment of love God and the second commandment, love others as self, are commandments inseparable. For, he said, there is no other commandment greater than these. So if indeed these two commandments are inseparable, inseparable expressions of our generous God, What might this inseparability mean for us today, especially in these days ahead? How can we love in these election days ahead, days, indeed, it may be days, How can we love those particularly adversarial neighbors Jesus calls us to love regardless as inseparable from loving our generous God? Are those expressions of love, could they be possible? Well, yes, Jesus would say, facing his adversary, facing his crucifixion by his adversaries. If he can say it then, yes, that love of neighbor is possible, even and especially those particularly adversarial neighbors who are members of our own family. And I know many of you have them, do you? Few? Mm Mm-hmm. I have a brother who's a fierce evangelical, a mighty and almighty Christian nationalist. You may have heard that phrase a lot recently, Christian nationalist, right? We've been hearing that phrase often. One who views their candidate like they view their Jesus, a totalitarian messianic redeemer of a world that has otherwise passed them by. And why not look for that messianic redeemer in the position so many are in? My brother is a Christian nationalist. And what makes my relationship to my brother so interesting is that, as you can see, we claim to be of the same faith. (laughs) The Jesus and God, I feel called to love in our first commandment today that God cannot possibly justify and legitimate the violence, the racism, the misogyny, the heterosexism, the demagoguery. My brother's God would be this totalitarian messianic redeemer. So how to love my adversarial neighbor, inseparable to how I love my God. When my adversary is my evangelical brother, the one who's pulling on levers such as gender justice to scare other people. Sometimes I do not know how to go about being compassionate with him these days. But I do know to be faithful to these great commandments that I must be at least willing to find a way. Find a way for him to remember that I am married to a refugee, an immigrant. Find a way to remember that in the midst of so many of us, all of us coming from an immigrant one time or another, How can I make room to love him when the people he follows, you know, 
but I'm called to love him, especially when I reflect on what I learned about this passage years ago. Learn how Jesus, the first century Jew, probably framed the second commandment today around love of family. Listen, when I arrived in Ann Arbor, I lived a mile from the church I pastored. And along that mile route, it was a steep hill where we would reenact with our Episcopalian siblings every year the Stations of the Cross on this big hill in Holy Week. Along that steep hill, the mile passage from my home to my church, along that steep hill lived the esteemed biblical scholar, the late, great David Noel Friedman. And it was David Noel Friedman who taught me something one day. What Jesus probably said originally in the second commandment. As a first century Jew, Dr. Friedman said, Jesus may not have used, may not have said how our Greek New Testament puts it, love your neighbor as yourself. For there was no concept of self in Jesus' cosmology apart from the community. What Jesus probably originally said was love your neighbor as your kinfolk, as your people, as your tribe, as your family. Love your neighbor as your kinfolk. Our kinfolk, the litmus test of all the neighborly rest. So as I'm going to ask you, do you have family like mine, extended family members perhaps, so longing this week to welcome a man back into power who would be Caesar? Kinfolk, you can scarcely find the energy to love right now. Kinfolk who nevertheless serve as Jesus' foundation for loving our neighbor. Or perhaps you have a neighbor, as we all do, who wishes the dictatorial same. How is it then that you are called to love your neighbor as we are called to love our kinfolk? Perhaps you do not know right now, but do know this. Do know that the more inseparable we see our love of God and love of neighbor, neighbor, kinfolk, whoever they might be, the more inseparable we see these first two commandments, the more willing and open and generous I, we are to the world around us. Reflecting God's gift of generosity shown to us back to our world. God's gift of generosity which we all today so desperately need. Amen.